All right, so what we're going to do at the beginning here is talk about a couple topics we didn't really have a chance to cover in detail at the end of last time. And this particularly relates to how the fork join framework behaves internally. Someone asked a good question on the discussion Piazza website earlier about join and uh, how does join behave with respect to uh, not really blocking. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about that and I'll try to show you a visualization and we can walk through some of the code. So this set of examples comes from here, from example 22. I went through this code last time in some detail. I may go through some of it again today, but I want to focus on a piece of it here. And this is the uh, apply all iter helper method, which was in the fork join utils .java class. So if you recall that the purpose of apply all iter was to take a list of elements of type T, some operation to apply to every element on the list, and a fork join pool in which to do the work. And then it goes ahead and internally it creates a list of results and a list of forks, which are fork join, or recursive tasks rather, fork join tasks actually. Um, and what it does is it goes through this list and it's going to do a bunch of stuff. So I'm going to kind of walk through this and show you what's going on under the hood. So what this code here is doing is it's walking through the original list, which is just in the list, if you recall from the example, it was a list of big fractions we wanted to apply some operation to. And it goes ahead and it makes a new recursive task, which for, for each element in the original list, it makes a new recursive task whose compute method when called, and we'll talk about when it's called in a second, is going to go ahead and apply the, uh, apply the operation to the big fraction, and then it returns that as the result. And you can see that what it's doing here is it's going through and making this new recursive task. It is forking that recursive task. We'll see what that does in a second. And then it's storing the forked result, not, not the result of the forking, but it's storing the task that we've made in the, for, the forks list. We have a linked list. So we're putting this thing in here and we're forking stuff off. Okay. So what that's going to do under the hood, as you can see up there on the um, right-hand side from your point of view, and that first work queue, is it's going to go ahead and enqueue everything into the original work queue or into, into a work queue, and it's the work queue that's associated with the worker thread that happens to be running this piece of code. So this piece of code, when it runs, is going to go ahead and throw everything into the work queue. And uh, in that case, it's all going to be sitting in that work queue. Any questions about that so far? That all just kind of puts everything into the first work queue. So remember, when, when fork is called, that arranges to execute the fork join task. And what that means is it sticks it in a queue, and it puts it in the queue of the owner worker thread, which is the guy that's, that's doing this. OK, any questions about that? So everything's in that queue. All right. Now, once things start going into that work queue, other threads in the pool which don't have anything in their work queues, other worker threads in the fork join pool that don't have anything in their work queues are going to say, gosh, we don't want to just sit here idle. We want to do computation. So they're going to go and they're going to start stealing work from the end of the other thread's work queue. So in the not too distant future, and we'll talk more about this in a second, in the not too distant future, these other threads will start wor stealing work. And so now we're going to have the, the work to do a bit more distributed evenly amongst the different threads to do it. Any questions about that? So what's the, what's the purpose of work stealing? Why does the fork join pool work steal? What's the purpose of that? Bruce. Right. So the idea here is we want to make things run as optimally as possible, we want to do as much computation as we possibly can. We don't want to have one, or we don't want to have one core doing a lot of work, and other cores just sitting around doing nothing. 
Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a second. So that's, that's basically what Fork, Fork is going to put stuff into the original queue, and then at some point shortly thereafter, we're going to go ahead and have the other threads will steal, start stealing work from the end of its queue. OK, so far so good. Now here's where things get interesting in this particular approach. Um, so what's going to happen now is that this main thread here is going to go ahead and wait for stuff to, to finish, right? And the key thing to note is that everybody's going to go ahead and participate in this, even the thread that's calling join. And this is the part that someone asked a question about. And this is a little confusing at first. Um, and so here's the way to think about this. I thought about this a little bit. I was trying to think of a good analogy for all this. And I decided I would use Jiffy Lube as my example. There are other examples too, but this one should make good sense if, if you know what Jiffy Lube is. Anybody here know what Jiffy Lube is? OK, so what does Jiffy Lube do? They do oil changes, but they do more stuff than that, right? So they'll change your oil, they'll check your uh, filters, they'll put air in your tires, they'll check the fluid levels in your car. There's like a, I don't know, a 12-item checklist that Jeff, Jiffy Lube does when you go in to get your oil changed. So, and, and there's typically a team of people who do that, right? So you, you, if you go to Jiffy Lube, they'll typically have, you know, multiple bays, right? Kind of like, you know, kind of like a thread pool in, in a way. And you've got multiple workers working in the multiple bays. So the way to think about this, we'll, we'll keep it simple. We'll say there's one bay just to make it easy. And so you know, work comes in, your car, and you get out of your car. And then a team of people descend on your car and start to service it. So that's kind of the pool of, of worker threads, right? So one model that you could use is, and this is what you probably do for insurance purposes, if nothing else, you get out of your car, and you stand there, and you wait, right? And then this team of people goes around and does stuff to your car. But in some sense, isn't that rather inefficient? Right? So while you're waiting for your car to be serviced, wouldn't it make sense if you pitched in? So while they are out, you know, checking your air, you could be wiping the windshield or, you know, cleaning the windshield, checking the wipers, someone's changing the oil, you know, looking for the fluids in the, in whatever, things like, you know, the, the water, uh, the window wiper fluid or whatnot. So you could really pitch in, right? There's nothing aside from insurance purposes that stops you from pitching in. If you pitched in, the work would probably get done faster, right? Because there'd be another body to help do the work. So that's kind of what happens when a join is called. So when a join is called, the worker thread that calls the, do the join doesn't just stand there, like we do when we go to Jiffy Lube, typically, waiting for everybody else to do the work. The worker thread that calls join is going to pitch in. And so it's going to go ahead and also run some of the tasks. And in fact, it, it can run tasks, and it can go and steal tasks, and do all kinds of other stuff. So the idea behind the fork join pool is that everybody pitches in. And so that's why a join in the fork join pool is not a classic thread join where you just wait and you know, go to sleep. You, you go into the waiting room and watch you know, the Jerry Springer show or something like that, do something mindless. You pitch in. And so that's what's going on. So that helps to explain why when join is called, it doesn't return until the task it's waiting on is complete. But while it's sitting there, it may be doing other stuff to get to this one faster, to get to its task faster. Now, eventually, it may actually have to block, right? Um, eventually, there may be no work to do. So a good example there is, you know, everybody's working on the car, and you're pitching in, and you wipe the windshields, and you check the tire pressure, and then you're all done with tasks. There's nothing else to do. And the, the person who's changing the oil, that's probably the longest thing it takes to, to do. So you know, once you finish everything off, you just may have to wait. But until that point, you're trying as much as possible to, to pitch in and get things done. Andrew. Yeah, great question. So the question is, is it only trying to do things related to itself? So it, the answer is no. It can, it can actually grab other stuff and do other work. And the whole way that the fork join pool is implemented, in fact, the, the real complexity in the fork join pool is the join. And so the reason it's complicated is they come up with all kinds of clever ways of trying to make things go, even if it's not your work, per se. You can still do other people's work. 
in order to advance the whole thing. So, so I guess the analogy there is once, once you've changed, you know, you've checked your tire pressure, if there's another car in another bay, you could go over there and start, you know, checking the tire pressure of that car too. So the idea is to try to keep things going as much as possible. Caleb. Yes. The, so the question, the question is, um, why are we trying to keep the number of threads in the pool relatively the same, if possible, um, and not create new threads? And the answer is that creating a new thread is enormously expensive, unbelievably expensive, compared to just reusing these things and keeping them busy. So, so think about it like this. I mean, we'll keep with our Jiffy Lube analogy. So one thing is, you know, rather than having the car driver pitch in, Jiffy Lube could call someone up and say, hey, we got a car in here. Can you, can you come in? Can you drive over from your house and, and help out? You know, Think how long it would take to call someone on the phone, get them to get in their car, drive over, pitch in, right? That would take minutes or hours, you know? Whereas if having the, the worker, the, the owner or the driver of the car just do it, boom. So you don't want to have to create new threads because that's a very expensive operation, enormously expensive, um, rather than just pitching in with the existing threads. Even putting threads to sleep and waking them up again is enormously expensive. So if you want more information about all that kind of stuff, let me give you a couple tips here. First, let me make sure that we're, hopefully this will show up. So um, Doug Lee Fork Join Framework. So take a look. If you want to learn about the fork join framework, then Doug Lee, who's the author of the fork join framework, has a nice video which you can watch and listen to, or there's also a transcript which you can just read his answers here. And he talks about a lot of this kind of stuff. He talks about how the fork join framework is designed. And then if you want to get a deeper understanding of current library components. Uh, if you want to get a deeper understanding of the costs of concurrency on modern platforms, watch Doug's video on engineering concurrent library components. I was actually listening to it this morning on my way to school. And he has a whole discussion in here about this very topic, about how in a modern multiprocessor, you, you certainly don't want to have to create new threads if you possibly can avoid it. That's really expensive. Even having a thread go to sleep and then waking it up if it can't work at the moment is enormously expensive. And so he talks in here about all kinds of tricks that they do in the implementation of the fork join pool and the Java virtual machine in order to avoid having to put threads to sleep. So the first order of business is to try to find more work for a thread to do if it doesn't have anything else to do. And that's where work stealing comes in, right? So that's another reason, again, why it's so important to try to use the common pool if you possibly can. Because the common pool tries to put all the work from all the different parts of a program slash process into the same pool that's managed by the same pool of threads. So as a result, irrespective of which part of your program is creating that work, you have a common pool that's working on all that stuff. So that's the idea to keep them all, giving them something to do. So that's part of it. Um, then he also talks about how Forking is really cheap because you're basically just pushing something onto a stack, uh, or onto a deck rather, in a, in a stack-like manner. Uh, and then he talks about how join is where all the hard stuff is in fork join. And that's because the idea is to keep everybody busy and working on things. So take a look at his video. He has lots of other great insights about all this stuff that's uh, really worth understanding. This, this uh, video is a couple of years old, but more or less everything he's talking about is still, is still pretty good. So here, here's, for example, the part of the video where he talks about um, different ways of trying to wait when you don't have anything to do at the moment. Um, and so he talks about one approach, which is called spinning. And he says, you know, this is sort of the classic way to spin. You have a loop that just does nothing, and it checks a condition that will be set, of course, by another thread when something changes. And he says, this particular approach does not work at all on modern hardware because the processor will think, this loop isn't doing anything. 
and therefore it powers down the core. And powering down a core and then restarting it is really, really expensive. So he explains in there why this is a bad idea. He then talks about other techniques um, for trying to handle this. For example, you might try to suspend yourself so if you can't make any forward progress, then you will suspend yourself until someone resumes you. And he, he shows this piece of code and he says, this is really bad. There, there's a lot of reasons why this is bad. But one reason it's bad is because it has something called a race condition. We'll talk more about that in the spring semester. Um, you should always use a, a while loop instead of an if because of the race condition. But even if the race condition wasn't there, suspending and resuming is unbelievably expensive. And so as you can see here, can be hundreds of thousands of processor cycles, core cycles, to block and unblock. So to suspend and resume a thread is really expensive. So you don't want to have to ever suspend and resume if there is something useful you can be doing. And then he talks about, um, let's see if this is where he talks about the adaptive spin implementations. Here we go. So if you watch this part, he'll talk about how they do all these bizarre tricks in the Java virtual machine and, and in the code that they write to, to do spin loops so that they actually generate random numbers and then they take those random numbers and they do stuff to them like XOR them and so on. And the whole thing there is to trick the processor into thinking something useful is going on so it won't put the cores to sleep, but they'll spin. And then they also spin for a certain amount of time. You don't want to just sit there and spin indefinitely because if there really is no work to do, then you're just wasting cores by spinning. So they spin for a while, and then they say, oh, we give up, we're not making any progress, and then they go ahead and sleep themselves. But that's only as a last resort. So these are some of the things that he talks about. It's a really, really interesting talk and chock full of good insights about modern multi-core processing and, and the challenges of trying to write code to maximize the underlying hardware in a way that's portable and maintainable over time. Okay, any other questions about any of that? So I just wanted to give you a little bit more insight about what's going on with fork join and how join in fork join doesn't block except as a last resort. And instead what it does is it pitches in and tries to do some of the work in order to move progress forward on getting computations done. And uh, Doug also talks at length about all the other parallel computing languages and abstractions like Scala and Clojure and um, Akka and so on, all of which are based fundamentally on the fork join framework because it's such a cool thing. Okay, so that, that's just kind of a recap. I wanted to make sure we covered that.